Nation's Trust Bank Private Banking is the epitome of elite banking. With its exclusive privileges devoted to providing just the right balance between financial success and lifestyle, our private banking members richly deserve. A financial solution dedicated to excellence with an unparalleled array of products and services that enrich, enhance and empower success. A financial solution focused on wealth creation, lifestyle and the establishment of legacy. A legacy of priority, a legacy of abundance, a legacy much desired. Creating a legacy that's timeless. Good evening. Uh... I have the pleasure of and honor of uh, introducing today's speaker. Uh, we have a, a champion of uh, Northern heritage, safeguarding Northern uh, communities, their rights, uh, their environment, as well as uh, uh, our environment of Sri Lanka. Uh, we have our speaker, the Sean Mukasekaran uh, uh, Vijay Mohan, the young Vijay Mohan, uh, went to Jaffna Central College and uh, did his uh, basic education. And then he went to uh, University of Peradeniya for his uh, BSc uh, graduate degrees. Uh, then followed uh, uh, the footsteps of the great uh, Charles Santhya Pillay, Professor Santhya Pillay and did his uh, PhD under Professor Santhya Pillay uh, at uh, University of Peradeniya and University of Missouri. Uh, he studied the human elephant conflict uh, of the North. He, uh, he tried various uh, approaches, very innovative, sometimes controversial, uh, to uh, uh, elevate livelihoods, the biodiversity, and safeguard Northern heritage uh, during the war, uh, times of war and after. Uh, he uh, became a lecturer at uh, the University of uh, Jaffna or Jaffna University as Dr. Uh, Vijay Mohan and later he pioneered the, uh, the establishment and uh, he is now at the, uh, the, as a senior lecturer at the University of Waunia. So he, he traveled back and forth between Jaffna and Waunia and uh, study the northern wildlife and communities and diversity. Uh, Dr. Vijay Mohan uh, is uh, one person uh, really pushing to uh, get the hanging fences to mitigate human elephant conflict in Mulativ area and elsewhere, as well as he, uh, he believed in uh, the northern communities and being a northern man, he's a champion to bring the light of science conservation, education to the far corners of this country. Uh, with that, I think I humbly invite, and also uh, Dr. Vijay Mohan is a, is a, uh, a member of the IUCN uh, Specialist Group of Asian Elephants, as well as IUCN Specialist Group uh, member of the uh, Crocodiles. So he's uh, internationally uh, known, locally uh, very well known, and, uh, and, 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 and regionally. Uh, a champion. Uh, he, he's a mentor of many uh, uh, students, especially in the northern regions, uh, and uh, uh, he'll be the ideal candidate uh, for us to, uh, to talk about the northern communities and their diversity. Dr. Vijay Mohan, stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Senaratna, <coughs> and uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for all the people who gathered here. And uh, I think this is my first talk with uh, such a uh, wonderful uh, audience uh, in Colombo. Uh, I know few friends or friend, few people who I'm meeting after about several years, because since I moved to Jaffna, to the north, uh, I 
lost contact uh, to the south, but uh, <clears throat> initially I have been traveling, working with uh, my mentor, Professor Charles Sandhyapule, and he introduced so many people here and uh, love to see you all again. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, I saw uh, uh, the WNPS has given a wide uh, uh, advertisement and uh, popular, popular, popularity for this talk. And uh, it says uh, the glory of wildlife wilderness uh, to uh, that we are going to talk but it's not the real glory but uh, the other side of it i'm going to talk about but uh, the wilderness uh, the wildlife and wilderness in the north the largely ignored but value uh, vital value so i am going to touch on the vital value of different sections the vital value of uh, the wilderness for the people who are living there with the wilderness and the vital value for the people who see that from outside north. So I'm going to just touch on that. And uh, sometime, uh, some, some of the things that I'm going to talk, many of might not agree, but uh, I see from a person, the, I see the problem, a person who lives in the north and who move around the people in the north. And this is their voice that I'm going to talk Maybe sometime you might not think this is not conservation that I'm talking. But anyway, uh, it's good to have some kind of controversial thing so that it can create some kind of discussion and through discussion, some good thing could happen. Okay, sorry. Right. <clears throat> so Northern forest is, is currently the largest intact uh, natural forest we could say which has been there for centuries and uh, that's from the dry zone but it's once famous for hunting ground from those days uh, during the british time because a lot of elite people from the south or even from around the country moved to north for hunting and where uh, two towns polyankulam mankulam and even vaunia was famous uh, they had uh, very established rest houses uh, for these hunters to come and stay there and go for hunting. And uh, the civil unrest escalated by mid 80s where I was in the school. And uh, during that time, uh, as far as I know, not, not much scientific studies were conducted in the country, but it's all started after mid 80s with the accelerated Mahawali program where the first ecological studies were conducted as a biodiversity survey and things like that. And with that only the enthusiasm of looking into the wildlife, studying wildlife, conservation of wildlife all started in a grand scale. So by that time, the northern province, the northern forest has become uh, not accessible to many people who wanted to study. So it was ignored, not ignored, but couldn't do it because of the civil unrest and uh, till 2010, after 2010, and all the people who were there was trying to go because it's one of the most unexplored and uh, unexploited uh, forest reserve, uh, wildlife wilderness, and many wildlife enthusiasts, as well as the researchers, was uh, turning their uh, interest into north. And this is a paper that uh, myself and Professor Charles Sandhyapulli published in 2003, uh, where we were able to go into the forest for the first time during the peace uh, uh, negotiations that taken place between the government and the LTT and uh, we saw the preservation of forest and it was pristine because uh, the the cover was needed for the fighting groups so that they preserved the forest and they grew for us in certain areas so that is the only outcome of the war that we consider as one of the blessings and we wrote this paper and uh, today you can see the large uh, the forested thick forested areas here in the north and that's the one third of the natural forest that we have in this country is in the north and uh, this functions as a large lung for the entire country to uh, clean the uh, polluted air and that is why one of the reasons why this uh, northern province is very important when it comes to the forest and this is uh, the the forest map uh, by the uh, survey department this was uh, updated in uh, 2080, but still we have uh, many intact, but uh, uh, the story is not the same. Uh, we will have a graph later on to show what's going on. 
so the post war situation is uh, different and it has uh, turned many people uh, flocking to north and uh, many of uh, the, the environmentalists and uh, environmental lovers including scientists uh, wanted to study because it's totally unexploited and unexplored so that anything what you do is new uh, for a scientist it's an easy uh, scientific paper and uh, for today's contemporary scientists is very important and a great enthusiasm to protect the wildlife and wilderness in the north but the values are different for the people who are living there and to the people who are seeing wildlife and the wilderness from outside so that is the major problem so uh, as everybody likes elephant is one of the major uh, animal or charismatic animal there uh, which is seen by uh, and a crop raider but uh, not uh, it has a little bit of a, a more uh, support and more it's been considered as a god so that uh, the affinities that uh, people have uh, in the north uh, till uh, a little bit of uh, preservation but uh, yesterday i saw a news item appeared in the tamil news uh, website uh, in mulatheev in one area uh, elephant herd came and destroyed 1600 coconut trees but i'm not sure whether the numbers are true or not, but that is what it appeared. And this is the message going to the public in the north. So 1,600 uh, coconut trees in one single night is something huge loss. And uh, this is what uh, people see as what is happening in the north and what the elephants are doing for the people in the north. And these monkeys, of course, a big problem, uh, especially in the southern part of uh, peninsula in Sahwacheri, Kodihamam and those areas are the major fruit producing uh, areas the tasty mangoes jackfruits uh, all sort of uh, the, all varieties of mangroves banana everything come from this area and uh, recently our honorable minister uh, of agriculture went to uh, uh, the southern part of its Tenmarachi you call it uh, southern part of uh, this peninsula and he started a, a fruit zone but uh, people uh, there uh, they have almost 50 percent of the people have almost abandoned any uh, idea of uh, even looking after their own fruit trees in their garden but uh, five years back uh, department of wildlife conservation uh, carried a major uh, project removing about 400 langurs from uh, northern province uh, southern part of the uh, peninsula and released it into Wilpatu National Park. So we really don't know on what basis it happened, uh, whether, but problem is not solved. Uh, it's still there. And uh, I don't know how these numbers have been uh, picked up, 400 to be removed, or whether they could see only 400 others have escaped by the time they captured the, the herds. We really don't know, but they are still there. And uh, again, uh, this purple face, Monkey is not a big problem, but uh, it is a problem in uh, areas where there are uh, water uh, and uh, Jaffna man, uh, people in Wani uh, are very fond of uh, wild meat, bush meat. So all of them are considered uh, a little bit of a delicacy. And uh, this, uh, especially the purple face is considered the uh, best thing for asthma, asthmatic people. So that's a traditional thing that they still do and they sell it as hanging deer. <laughs> That's the name that they give, Tongumar. Uh, they don't want to say monkey uh, because it's a bad name, but they name it as hanging deer, Tongumar, right? And uh, of course, wild boar uh, is a pest. Again, these are the pests that I'm putting up here, uh, but it's a it's welcomed pest because uh, it's immediately it end up in the dishes. So they love it uh, to get it there similar with the porcupine right and it's a pest uh, it doesn't so i'm showing it and i'll come back to a little later uh, squirrels are extremely considered uh, one of the major destructive of uh, coconut uh, flowers and coconut trees and murunga uh, jaffna murunga is very famous and they export and they have a big export uh, company uh, industry going on but one of the major pests is uh, the squirrels uh, but now what they do is they don't export the fruits but they export the leaves they had a good demand for the leaves at the moment in, in foreign countries 
So they do it and uh, they have a little bit of uh, alternative way of finding out. And this giant squirrel, again, you all know that it's also been considered one of the best in the country and uh, the shooting order was given by the Ministry of Agriculture. Now, right, uh, you can shoot them if you want and uh, that's also a problem. Uh, bats, again, a pest for the fruits, but still some people eat them also, right? There are certain areas where people uh, would like to eat uh, bat meat. One of the, the moment they see uh, 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 hair, it has no way to escape. But this fortunate uh, uh, hair is in my garden in, in Vaunia. So, <laughs> so I shot it uh, with my camera and uh, he's, uh, he's still there peacefully, but I'm really worried whether whenever he was, who's going to see this first and that will be the end of the day. But again, a, a pest. Uh, even the birds, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the whistling teal and uh, they don't like whistling teals coming to the uh, paddy field when after the sowing the, the seeds because they say they come and drink the paddy. That, that's how they call it. They, if they sit in large numbers, next day you don't see any paddy growing in the paddy field. A large uh, peacock becoming, uh, it's going up in the ladder. Uh, beating all the pests in the country, even above elephants, peacock. This has become uh, one of the major uh, problem now uh, in many and whatever they see, they, the farmers say, you cannot just have anything growing in a barren ground. Some, if you put a seed and something growing, peacock come and picks it up. So they don't. And uh, initially uh, peacock meat was a delicacy, but now of course uh, it's not much. People, I don't hear, uh, they, they, they hunt peacock for meat. Uh, unless otherwise it sometime uh, accidentally happens. But uh, many areas of uh, forest has been opened and uh, they are converted into grassland. So grasslands are wonderful breeding places uh, for peacock. So they love uh, garden, uh, open area in forest because they are the ground dwelling uh, birds and they put their eggs on the ground. And uh, we have eliminated almost all the enemies of the peacock uh, eggs and chicks, no jackals, no snakes, nothing, no wild boars. So they are increasing in number. So these are the problems that uh, they have. But for for, for you all, uh, if you come to Vaunia, uh, just past Vaunia, you see peacocks. Ah, peacock, take a photograph. Uh, that's how you see it. But for them, it's nothing. Even deer has become a pest in uh, some of the areas, border villages uh, around the uh, bordering the forest, they come and they feed on the uh, farmland and uh, the vegetation or the crops. And also, it's also another welcomed uh, uh, animal because they love venison. And uh, the, the last few months ago, it was uh, the festival time in Jaffna. A lot of people flocked from uh, expatriates, all our people who went from Jaffna many years back, they come back and they hired three wheelers from Jaffna all the way to Vaunia to buy venison. So it's, the business is booming. And uh, even in Vaunia, you can easily find, if you are very familiar with the, some of the restaurants, you can get deer meat. This has been informed several times by myself to the Department of Wildlife Conservation, but it's very difficult to catch them also. And uh, it's even once uh, this was uh, served in my canteen, university canteen, in, in, in my university, University of Vaunia, we have a patch of forest that is being preserved where we have deer. We have about a herd of 20, 25 deer, and that's the last uh, patch of forest in that region. So we were able to preserve it for the wildlife, and we have uh, deer, samba, not samba, sorry, deer, uh, uh, mouse deer, uh, uh, wild bow, uh, hair and all other wildlife are there. So we preserve it and they are still there. But I don't know whether this canteen man was able to get a deer from the forest or he got it from somewhere else. But uh, the warning has uh, warned him and then he has stopped doing it. But the, and what I'm trying to say is that it is frequently available. If you really want it, you can go to Vaunia. Uh, crocodiles have been considered pest for the fishermen where when they lay the nets to get the fish and which fish get caught in the net and they come to eat the feed the fish also sometimes when they go across they get entangled 
and then they break the net and sometimes they get entangled and they cannot get away with the net and uh, fishermen next day when they come they get the larger crocodile instead of a small fish again end up in their kitchen uh, especially in uh, Murungan area what's the problem with this it's also considered a pest uh, especially when you plant corn and this is the first time I heard about it uh, you, when you put corn to first time and before they grow they this uh, lizards come and they eat the corn so if the number of uh, corn, uh, lizards come and next day you half of the corn plantation is gone so this is first time I heard that even this has a pest right but so far nobody eats lucky fellows uh, birds the egrets that you have uh, you see them in large numbers uh, when plowing is going on because there are plenty of uh, uh, worms coming out during the plowing but uh, after sowing seed they don't want these birds to come because when they walk they push the seeds inside so that they don't germinate so that there are people with the catapult chasing the so some of these things is uh, maybe new to you all and it was new to me also when I first found it uh, and then uh, the, the pest for livestock and poultry leopards it's easy to kill them only to poison them with uh, uh, put some poison into the meat and they'll die next day and for the cattle when they most of the cattle have been sent into the forest for grazing so that's the time they become easy prey but the next day you don't see them and uh, nobody can find out when you kill a leopard it's easy to dispose you can just uh, dig a, a thick uh, uh, deep uh, cavity and then put it and put earth nobody can find uh, killing an elephant you cannot dispose it you cannot destroy it easily but uh, a leopard very easy so that we really don't know actually what's happening to the leopards and i know that uh, wnps has started a leopard survey there but uh, how they are getting the real information may be difficult because they are all aware of uh, if they tell the truth what's happening but i don't see there is kind of a skin or anything is being sold that type of things are not there but cattle herders are the major threats for the leopards again for uh, poultry and uh, sometime uh, small animals like uh, even uh, the calves of uh, goats and other thing have been taken by uh, even by jungle cat and uh, they don't like them there poultry jackal is uh, the major problem for poultry uh, uh, the mongooses all three mongooses are major problem for poultry any animal without legs a long elongated body been killed uh, they don't uh, want to see whether it is poisonous or non-poisonous uh, immediately the first things to do is to kill them right then only you think about it but uh, the cobra has a little bit of blessings from the people they are scared to kill because they think the cobra can um, give uh, bad sayings and it can so that they worship and ask them to go and as the same thing happens in the uh, southern part of the country uh, bear uh, is a problem when the palu fruits are fruiting because bear also loves palu trees, palu fruits, and people go into the forest to sell palu tree uh, fruits outside on, along the roadside to the bypassing people. And that's the time they come in conflict with bear. And uh, many accidents take place, and you can see in escalation of uh, uh, injured people, bear injuries uh, escalating during the palu season. Also, when people go for hunting for honey, again, they also come. And uh, I met a person who loves bear meat. Uh, and I asked, uh, how can you eat bear? He said, no, what's the problem? He, they, the bear eats only vegetarian, mostly uh, the fruits. And uh, why can't we eat bear? And he says that he eats bear. OK, I don't know how many. And uh, these animals I ignored. They, nobody care about it. And uh, sometimes this has a bad omen. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, having a, a loris in front of your house is not considered uh, something that is good because they consider they always cry and it always sorrow and it brings bad message to the house so they don't want to see a loris but if you see the loris they don't kill i don't think they kill but they cut the tree 
so that uh, he has uh, no chance of seeing them. The shrews, of course, are very important, ecologically important. People kill shrews, mistaking it for a rat. And the moment they see in near the house, immediately they kill them. Bats, of course, they don't know the value of bats and these uh, uh, fresh uh, the micro bats are not a problem for the people, but they are ecologically important and their distribution and their numbers are good in uh, controlling agriculture pest, but people don't actually care about it. But there is another story about these uh, bats. When a bat enter into a house, you are no longer staying inside the house. You will leave the house. If it is rented house, you will have to see another house very soon. And they believe in that. Yeah, they don't like a bat entering into the house. But there are other animals in the menu. Turtles, crocodiles, I already mentioned land monitors, jungle fowl, partridge, stalks, egrets, cormorants, pangolin, samba, mouse deer, barking deer, all are in the menu of many people. But we cannot blame them because uh, during the 30 years of war, it is the wildlife that kept them going. It is the wildlife that produced the uh, supply, the protein for the people. I'm not a person against hunting uh, because as far as it's sustainable, because we ourselves uh, human evolved as hunters, hunter gatherers, and uh, we lived uh, with harmony, even though we are hunting. But unfortunately, the exploded, uh, exploring uh, exp uh, the increasing number of population is became uh, non-sustainable. So that is why the hunting is non-sustainable. But people in Vanni are still can exploit the forest because it's large enough to sustain uh, their need, but it cannot be something that they can sell it outside. They, the, the, the forest is not, uh, it, does, it doesn't have enough uh, resources to supply the entire country or even Jaffna Peninsula. So that is where the problem comes. So <clears throat> value for the other people, how they look at uh, wilderness uh, in the north, they wanted to preserve a wilderness. They want. They, they all wanted to safeguard this. Uh, what is left behind uh, after the war? And uh, there are plenty of uh, studies been now conducted. Number of papers has been already. This is. Uh, they have done a, a survey in Sarasale, in Jaffna, and there was another paper was uh, published uh, in the Indian Cursor in Nadintivu, and uh, of course, our professor. Uh, Sampa Seniviratna has done wonderful study and uh, groundbreaking studies of uh, migration of birds uh, that comes to the north, Mena, and other places. So everybody is interested in uh, safeguarding and conserving the wildlife in the north and the wilderness. And they see it's uh, completely because we don't have it here. That wilderness, we don't have it here. We, it's very difficult to, if you see a, a hare crossing Columbo roads, it will be a great thing for you all. But it's not the case uh, in, uh, in the north. Once you pass uh, Vaunia, uh, that's the case. And uh, also, uh, this, this uh, map shows the number of uh, areas has been declared as a national park in the northern province. The, the Nadantivu, there is a national park. Uh, Chundikulam, there is a national park. Giant's Tank, Madhu Road jointly has been declared as a national park. So these were initially uh, sanctuaries, uh, in not the Nadindivu, but uh, Chundikulam and Madurod, Giant's Tank and Vaunikulam were the sanctuaries in the northern province. But uh, suddenly, all of a sudden, it has been declared as a national park. So as far as I know, the, the major difference between the national park and the sanctuary, it have the same protection, but national park, you can enter only with a permit. So you get the permit by getting a ticket. You buy a ticket and you get the permit. Sanctuary, you can trespass, but uh, you cannot do anything else. But it also a protected area as a national park. But when you make it national park, you are keeping the people who have been using these areas out of it. Then those people who are crossing and those people who have been using this for centuries has become illegal uh, entries. So that is the problem. And uh, when these national parks are established, uh, no concern taken from the people who are living there. Uh, it was just a, a central government uh, decision to take. And uh, Nadintivo is uh, only 50 square kilometer area. And 38 kilometers has been declared as national park to preserve the horses there. But these horses are not indigenous to Sri Lanka. And these horses are being owned by people in Nadintivo. 
and if you see them closely you can see markings on that but the other people say they are feral of course they are feral they have been not been uh, looked after but they are exploited uh, initially the the horses were used uh, by the people to catch cattle because there are a lot of feral cattle so they train some of the horses and go on these horses to catch the cattle now of course they do it on the motorbike so they don't do much but they still go and catch the horse in the on the motorbike they just chase it's easy to catch a horse once they are born and there is a little now that it has become a little bit important because a lot of people are coming to see uh, horses in Nadindi, which was not there before the war but these are all uh, recent developments so everybody wanted to claim the ownership so there's a competition between the horse owners who catch the calf first and put their marking on the uh, the baby so it has gone to that level because now they worry they, they, they think that in a way that there can be a demand for their horses <laughs> because the tourists are coming to see them or, but nothing happens but they do what they do is they go behind a horse when they see it's a newborn and no marking they chase them on the motorbike until they go uh, completely tired and it's easy to catch them in. but it's so strange that uh, we have a national park for kind of captive animals in a way right uh, why and uh, the Nadantivu people uh, I, I have been uh, Nadantivu last week only about a month ago but when I spoke to them they say they don't bother about the uh, national park and all the people are moving in in and out but once you have a national park then that has a little bit of uh, uh, earning property uh, property it should have it should bring some remittance to the government but uh, Nadantivu is, is so far they don't have a gate or they don't have a counter by the department and similarly in the uh, Madhu Road, other places, it's not an established uh, national park, have a gate distributing tickets. But uh, in Chandik Chundikulam, it happens. But still, many uh, fishermen are suffering because of some areas are not, have, it's now, it's not, it's penetrable, it's not, uh, they are not uh, allowed to trespass that. So these are the, some of the problems where we scare the northern people by making these uh, protected areas. Uh, so that even if we go for a research, they are worried. You come and do the research and you tell, tell something is important in this area. Next day they come and declare it as a protected area or national park, then where, are we, where we have to go. So this is, I don't know why wildlife department has done this without the concern of the people there. They should have talked to them and it should, uh, the, whatever the wildlife uh, uh, protection, conservation, should be with the people unless you make the people of that area happy the conservation is not going to work and uh, uh, i know that uh, professor sampath is working on the migratory birds uh, especially flamingos we had a discussion and we came to know that uh, some places where flamingos are trying to come and feed in areas people were there with the stones pelleting at them you don't want the flamingos to be there because cat that the flamingos areas, once you have the flamingos, it will be a protected area. Wankale has become a protected area uh, in this uh, region, this uh, light green. It is now a Ramsar site. So, uh, no, certain places you have to do it, it's important. But at the same time, we cannot eliminate the people from that place because these people have suffered the war for 30 years and they also look for development. They also look for a, a better lifestyle so without giving that and we go immediately and try to safeguard that for the purpose of conservation it has to be done but is it so hurry and are these areas are extremely vulnerable to be destructive in another five years time so we have to think that and we can do it little slowly and uh, many areas in the north has been uh, 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 in the entire north has been uh, declared as forest department conservation area uh, which people have their deeds for those areas so how did they put the boundaries of uh, conservation areas they looked at the google map wherever there are thick forest they put boundaries these are conservation areas for uh, forest department but these people were there and they left the area and they displaced internally and internationally and when they come back these areas are demarcated as so they don't like uh, the conservation efforts have been made now 
myself and Professor Sampath went to a small island here, Iranadiv, and his research have shown that all the birds that come from abroad uh, during the migration, at least his all the birds that have been collared by him, at least goes once to Iranadiv. So we wanted to go and see what Iranadiv is, but it was a very difficult task. We made it somehow, and what was a wonderful journey uh, during the high seas. Uh, but again, uh, if Iranadiv is going to, be, it's only a few people are living in Iranadiv, not all the people. It is a temporary uh, village where the all of them are living in the mainland, but they use it as a temporary uh, settlement, and there's a school also. Uh, only few people are there, but uh, they don't want to uh, mean. Uh, kind of making it a national park and making them alienating from that area or explain, uh, uh, expelling their say, people from that particular place. Uh, I don't think that should be done. So far, there's no problem for any birds and there's no development is taking place. These birds are migrating with the people for so many years. And uh, for Nadantivu also, these uh, horses, they have been brought by uh, Hollanders uh, 500 years ago, and we re I, we really don't know why they brought it to Nadantiv. Uh, only uh, Nadantiv, we don't see them anywhere else, but we see one or two maybe uh, export. But the large number is still found in Nadantiv. But for 500 years during the war time, they are still there. But suddenly, when people went from the south, they saw them emaciated during the dry season, and uh, their body condition is very poor, and they felt very sad about the horses. And now they have built tanks, water tanks, to give them water during the dry season. But what we are doing is that we are now interfering, poking our finger into the natural selection and natural balance of horses in that area. What will happen? It will increase in population now. Already there is, uh, when I went last month, people were complaining that the horse populations are increasing. So what we are going to do with the increasing population? Already in Mana, uh, the people are having enough problem with uh, donkeys. They are sometimes when they get into heat, they start chasing and the males start to fight and they start running without control and they get into accidents and number of people have died. And it had happened in Kalpitya, but Kalpitya population is, I don't know what's going on with the Kalpitya population, but these are the problems. If it happens, the same thing with the horses, and that can be a problem for the people. So why do we think about, why don't we think about science and why don't we think about how the population has been managed all these days without water and why suddenly we want to give water and try to, just because our emotion is playing major role in conservation than science. We'll come to that a little later. So one good story is that uh, this uh, A9 in the middle of the forest, which is the largest intact forest that connects the the east from the west, uh, actually, technically speaking, an elephant in uh, Vilpatu, North Vilpatu, as can actually can move all the way to from west to east and all the way down to south. Continuous forest is there. And it's only in our country, we can draw uh, elephant home range without taking the handout. It's one polygon, we can draw the home range. That's the only country in the world we have such a home range. Uh, with a small country, 60% of the land area comes under elephant range. So with 22 million people. So it is the people who have accepted them. Uh, out of 60%, only 14% is protected areas and another 10% comes under forest department. And rest is where people and human are sharing the land. But we have so much of elephants. Uh, we have the last, according to the last survey, we have around 6,000, but we don't know what, because last 20, 12 years, uh, no survey has been done. So we really don't know what's the situation. But it is the people who accepted the killings happening, but still people have accepted. So with that, uh, the north is a very important point now, because the, the forest that is on the west is a small portion until up to Vilpatu, just above Putlam. But on the east, it has completely all the way down to the south. Now we have A9 in the middle. So this is just in one day, you can see the time here, 7.22 and 7.28. But I just took only two, because I travel every morning, not every morning, every week, sometime or once in a or twice a week, 
every day when I go in the morning, I see enough number of killings, road killings. So this is a golden palm civet, I uh, suppose, right? And this is a, uh, yeah, again, a golden palm civet in uh, within about a few kilometers, but there are plenty. Uh, if you go in the morning, you can see them, but by the time daytime comes, you don't see uh, much of them because they have been eaten by other animals and other birds. You can see birds have also been hit, uh, especially carnivores, scavengers, because of the traffic. So uh, the traffic is so high in the night most of the heavy vehicles are flying in the night. So 24 hours, this A9 is completely, vehicles are going up and down. So actually what happens is that we are dividing this, the big forest into two big sections, not two big section, one big section and another small, when it compares to the, the, the area of the forest. For us, it might look big, but this will become segmented uh, from the, east if we are going to keep on going doing that because we only think crossing of elephants and large animals but we don't think about small animals crossing even a lizard how can they cross even a mongoose how can they cross even a small uh, rat on from one side to another side they, they have a chance to cross <clears throat> so these are the things that we forget uh, and i put this especially because uh, the original Jaffna Colombo road is from Colombo, Putlam, Vanati Villu, through Vilpatu, Taladi, Punarian, and Jaffna. That's the original road to Jaffna. But now, of course, this road is closed. It was open for some time. Now that road is closed. And uh, there's a lot of opposition to open this road uh, and develop this road so that you can, uh, that people can go. So here I have given. The, the distance. If you go through Vaunia, 410 kilometers from Colombo to Jaffna, and if you go through Vilpatu, 80, 80 kilometers less. And from Trinko, if you avoid Vaunia and bypass Vaunia, go to straight to Parandan, then another 80 kilometers less. But uh, we actually have a lot of pressure, and there's a case on opening this Vilpatu road. But my point is here if you open these two roads, 50% of the traffic will be less on the main road. That will save more wildlife than closing the road on these two sides. If you reduce the, the traffic here, the entire forest can be considered as one large conservation area. Otherwise, what we have is a small portion on this side, small portion on the other side. But it's very difficult to convince people because this is all on population genetics, science. We have established uh, concepts, formulas. What is the effective population size? What, how much population, how much male-female ratio we have to have to have our population going without any genetical damage for another thousand years? It's been established, this has been a test. What is population fragmentation? What is the effect of population fragmentation? What is the effect of inbreeding depression? When a population becomes smaller, inbreeding increases. And what is the effect of inbreeding depression? Sorry, genetically viable population. What should be the size of a population if it is genetically viable for another thousand years? Minimum viable population, sustainable population size. And uh, what we are doing is whether protection or conservation. It's a two big different words. Protection is not conservation. Conservation comes through management of population. When you say management, it is the involvement of human, scientific involvement. Protection is just you put a boundary and you say no touch, just leave it. So what we do, whether it's protection or protection can be uh, if it is if it is in a natural balance, protection can work. But if we have disturbed the natural balance, protection is not going to work because it will destroy one species and it will increase the population of another species. But we are not considering any of these when we talk about uh, conservation in our country. So this is, I consider it's an important message here for this uh, group of uh, people here who all are, who all are here. And uh, we some, sometimes we take uh, conservation effort uh, based on emotions and religious uh, basis, but not on the scientific basis. So how can we prevent road accidents? There are ways that you can prevent road accidents. There are uh, roads that go through wildlife uh, parks in other part of the country and uh, people can see, you also can see, 
can you see what's happening in between Buttala and Kadarhamam? Uh, 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 Along that road now, people are feeding elephants. This is one of the outcomes of when you let the people go through. But that's not the problem of the people. That's the problem of us. Our system doesn't work properly. Our law is not implemented properly. That's why people have started feeding the elephants. And we have, we have given a bad behavior for the elephants because we did not implement the law properly. If you take action properly, nobody will feed the elephant. You, if you find somebody to feed the elephants, immediately take action, take, take them under the law, take them to the courts. They will stop feeding the elephants and elephants will not come there after that. It's simple, it's not a big deal. So even in the north, along the Vilpatu road or along the eastern road, we can establish and there are plenty of uh, technology that we have in, around the world to monitor the speed or reduce the speed. And uh, we also can have uh, awareness program for the drivers, reduce the speed uh, and by going 30 kilometers distance from uh, almost from Omande to Kilnochi, it's only about 60 kilometers. And that's the only area where this uh, wildlife in the north and east, are, uh, the, the western and east are crossing. Uh, just reduce the speed for one kilo, 160 kilometers and you might, then you can apply the brakes when an animal is crossing. Or then reduce the speed that when it's going a little late from 12 to 4 o'clock in the morning, you reduce, even reduce it. You can have cameras to find out who are speeding and you can catch them on the other side. And it's not going to make any big difference. It's only about 15 minutes or half an hour difference that they will lose if you do that. So it's not a big deal. But the only thing is, how are we going to implement? How are we going to the, make use of the law? So many people can avoid night, night traveling and uh, many accident happens because we, <laughs> we don't like to dip our lights. When we see an opposite coming on the opposite side, we always want to focus it towards the driver and make him blind. And we are so happy in doing this. We don't want to, these cars at the, at the moment, you have this white light, bright light, and they don't dip at all unless you ask to dip. It's, it should come as a practice. The moment you see a vehicle coming in front, you have to dip it. So we don't do that. So when you dip, Sometimes animals crossing, we cannot see until the last moment it happens. So these are very important things that we can still do, right? And uh, why the animals can, uh, so we have to give these messages, educate parents, elders, and other people. Through schools, we can teach the children and ask their relatives, if they are drivers, to follow certain things. Maybe difficult, but we can still try. But the implementing law can definitely prevent road accidents in the A9 road. So this is uh, one uh, research study uh, came out of uh, in, with Jaffna University student, uh, geography student. And uh, we studied the satellite maps uh, from 1990 to 2020, 10-year uh, satellite map uh, to see what has happened to the forest uh, cover in the north. And you can see the forest cover in green has dripping down, dropping down. And uh, also you can see agriculture land is, and is going up. And the home, homeland, is a home garden, is also going out in numbers. So this is in last 10 years, uh, soon after the war or end of war. So from here, you can see it's a huge drop, right? But uh, this is an alarm. At the same time, uh, we cannot uh, just stop uh, because it shows some kind of development is happening in the uh, region. And uh, the next graph shows uh, how it has changed right in each year, uh, 10 years time, uh, 19 to 20, 14 to 20. And so this is the, the forest, uh, dense forest. It's going on the negative side and uh, the home gardens are going up on the positive side. So these uh, uh, studies indicates some kind of development is happening or some kind of human activities uh, increasing. And also, it's not corresponding the home garden and the dense, declining of dense forest, declining and dense forest, and you can see the barren land increasing. So this is the clearing of forest, uh, cutting uh, uh, trees, uh, wood, firewood, and also mining gravel. So that's the main reason. That's why we come as barren land, no vegetation. So that's what you call this uh, defined as barren land. When uh, the north is uh, 
uh, inch by inch is monitored by the military at the moment. But how can this happen? So when we ask the military, they say, this is not our problem. That's police has to look after. So when they ask the police, they say, no, we don't have enough resources to look after them. These people are doing at their higher authorities and they are giving us call. But anyway, this is what happening. So we cannot blame only the, the home garden going up, but this is very alarming that you can see increasing of that after the war. It was not happening before that, because these are satellite pictures that we looked at. So it is very important that uh, uh, we, as the, uh, the people who love wildlife, people who love uh, the wildlife in the north, people who cherish wildlife is actually a, a resource for us. And we have cleaned almost all the wildlife in the southern part of the country. And this is what we have, north and the east. It is from you who ha which has to, the message has to go. And uh, for the people living in Vani, uh, in Vani uh, the problem is, it's their lifestyle. It's their survival for the next day. They are all, most of them, 90% of Vani region, not uh, in the Northern Peninsula, but in the Vani region are displaced people. So they have set resettled, uh, or sometimes they have been resettled in a new place where the older area of places where they have lived uh, under forest cover or under Department of Forest has taken, or it is on the military camp or whatever it is. So they have been settled in the new. So they have to clear uh, the area and they have to live. So it is only what they are looking for is their survival for the next day. And they, do, they all lived wealthy. They were wealthy farmers in the past. They are very good uh, farmers and they were self-sustainable at the uh, before the war. And uh, now they have lost everything because the NGOs have trained them to receive. I tell them, right, your hands were like this in early 70s and 80s. Now it has turned this way, receiving. Everything is you receive. Everything they are looking for handouts. Everything they are looking for aid. Everything they are looking for something that comes tomorrow. If, if they get uh, some aid tomorrow, that's fine for them. And that's what they are looking for. And they have been trained or not trained, but they have been uh, uh, spoiled to look for handouts. So that is the situation in Vani. So they, they are not bothered about the wildlife that they have. Fortunately, we have enough wildlife uh, in the north that is healthy, uh, sustainable. Uh, even if you don't do anything, uh, if you just uh, protect them in a proper way, but not at the way by eliminating people. And these people are already suffering uh, with uh, their uh, looking after. And again, we come and tell that, OK, this is protected area. This is national park. You all go out. You cannot go through this. You cannot go from here to there. And uh, if you have to go, you go around and things like that. So it's not going to work because unless you make them happy, uh, they are not going to cherish the wildlife, what they have. Uh, and uh, uh, unlike other provinces, uh, like uh, the North Central province, the Northern province also have uh, plenty of uh, small water holes like ponds, tanks. And uh, these are the larger ones, the Iranamadu, uh, this Vaunikulam, Muthenkattu, uh, sorry, this is Akarayan, uh, Muthenkattu, and the Vaunikulam is here, Giant's Tank. Those are the larger ones here. But in addition to that, you have these lagoons, uh, this Jeffna Lagoon is largest, but you have the Thondamanaru Lagoon here, and then uh, the the uh, the rest of the Jeffna Lagoon that opens uh, at uh, Vetilakurni here, and then some of the lagoons and some uh, marshland here in uh, Jeffna Peninsula. So there is wealthy of uh, fresh water, but still at the moment, uh, Jeffna Peninsula suffers with uh, uh, there is no proper fresh water because most of the fresh water bodies have been polluted. Uh, polluted by fecal contamination as well as uh, agriculture contamination. Uh, when I was there in the school in uh, Jaffna town, the town area uh, did not have uh, cesspits. It's all buckets, right? Uh, so that uh, the, the fecal matter doesn't go into the ground. So, But the houses are very narrow, but every house had a well. Now that after the war, there were no people to collect the fecal material. They come in the morning and collect it and go and dispose it somewhere else. With the war, this all they, those people couldn't do it and they all have left the country. So they all have to now dig a cesspit. So water is completely contaminated and you cannot drink at all. Uh, I, I, I just drank water from the well when I was a, a student in Jeff. Now I live in uh, uh, near Kokuville. 
we are still uh, I drink water from the well. Uh, it's okay so far, no problem. But they say that it, you might have high amount of uh, nitrogen. So Jaffna Peninsula as a whole is facing a huge water crisis at the moment, especially drinking water. And uh, there's a lot of projects have started or had been at least been discussed. It's not started at least at the discussion point by the Northern Provincial Council uh, Irrigation Department. And uh, there are a number of them. Now they wanted to convert Punerian Reservoir, the Punerian Lagoon into a freshwater reservoir. So that can supply water and it can replenish uh, the, the groundwater and uh, it can give water for the people even after rains. Uh, in Vadamarachi Lagoon, this lagoon they are considering making into freshwater. Actually, this portion is opening to the sea at Point Pedro here and then Vetrila Kearney here. So if you block these two, what you are going to save is fresh water during the rainy season. But still it is uh, salty and that is what uh, there's a barrage here in Point Pedro and uh, this is a natural barrier that opens only during the rainy season. So this barrage is closed to prevent seawater entering into the, the, the Tondamanar Lagoon. So we consider it's a very ancient uh, uh, system of uh, preventing uh, uh, seawater mixture. And that is the, the major, uh, uh, the water recharge into the Jaffna Peninsula. But at the, currently it has been salty because of the sea spray and other thing. So it's got, and then the barrage was not working properly for some time, so it's all salty. And uh, you can see uh, the large, uh, the mangrove forest along this uh, road so that goes from here along this road all the way to uh, Point Pedro. You see the large mangrove, so that shows is a uh, brackish water. But, uh, and then uh, this lagoon is going to be converted, the uh, alternative proposal for the Jaffna Lagoon scheme of the, the southern part of the Jaffna Lagoon scheme where the major uh, tanks discharge into the Jaffna Lagoon where they wanted to make it as a freshwater content. Uh, and this is the entire thing together. And then uh, the Iranamadu uh, extended area proposed Karipatamuripu Rasavaya with Iranamadu here and they wanted to have a large area to prevent uh, floods uh, during the high heavy rain season. So they want to make it. So these are all areas where they come under forest. And this is uh, Paliar uh, area where they are considering to open up uh, that and ex extend it into expo uh, freshwater reservoir. So these projects definitely going to change this graph again. And uh, you will see it will even further coming down. But I'm 100% sure uh, I can uh, predict that there'll be a lot of opposition from the south for this to happen. But it's okay, but because of the enthusiasm, you might uh, uh, gather or you might listen to some other people and you might say, okay, this you cannot do it because it is the wilderness that is important in the north. But also I am requesting here, you all must have to think about the people and think about the need, the basic need of water. And what we have to think is how much forest that we need to preserve a genetically viable population for future. That is the most important. So that has to come with science. Instead of fragmenting the, uh, the forest that we have in the north that connects from north, we have to keep that the connection. Then only the gene pool will be mixed. Otherwise, the gene pool will, there'll be two population, two different population. A smaller population will suffer from inbreeding depression and the genetical uh, random genetic drift. These are all signs that we have uh, uh, been teaching to the students, but not, nothing is being practiced. So that is what very important for us. And uh, in addition to this, uh, the our Honorable Minister, as she uh, signed uh, uh, the ministerial post, the first thing she tell, told was converting Jeff Mana Island into a nightclub. That was the first message she told that she told that uh, mana is only for dry fish and it was considered as uh, punishment transfer now we will convert into a nightclub and then that will bring dollars but uh, she forgot that even dry fish also can bring dollars 
uh, and uh, ecotourism can bring dollars. Uh, whatever the natural resource we preserve can bring dollars. So I have to write a, an article uh, against that. But uh, anyway, I don't know how far it's gone. And uh, this is a uh, uh, tree plantation in uh, from uh, Jaffna to Vailane into the islands. So you can see it's you can see about this kind of tree planting for three, three to four kilometers. But uh, these trees are not belong to this area at all. This is the grassland. So why do you want to put trees? And uh, they think it's conservation, but it is pollution, which is not supposed to be there. Because that environment is uh, inundated with water, and then uh, it has uh, it, it 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 attracts huge amount of uh, uh, migratory birds for that particular environment. So if you plant trees, and you are going to convert this environment into a forest environment, this is what we think. We think only the forest is natural nature conservation, which is wrong. And you can see how much they spend. They the three lines of trees, and they pump water every day. And but still they are not going to grow. But even if they if you make it grow, you are going to convert this into a, a, a system that is not supposed to be there. Mangrove conservation program. The mangroves are not naturally there. They are not supposed to be there. Again, you are converting a non mangrove area into mangrove area. That's also pollution. People don't think monoculture of mangrove. They don't grow like this. They don't grow in rows. And this environment is already being used by another thousands of species for their survival. Now we are just because we are thinking only green, we are thinking only tree, we are thinking only about mangroves, but we forget all the living organisms, the, the worms and other things that has been feeding all the birds all these years. This is what they think conservation in the north. People come from south, just do it without asking, without doing any scientific study. Why should they do it? Why should they uh, plant mangroves where there are no mangroves? If it is uh, destroyed the mangrove plantation, you better do it fine. But why you are doing it in a new area? So these are the questions that I would like to and it's a wild uh, wildlife and wilderness is huge and it's very important and it is wealth for our country, the entire country, not for the north alone. And if North benefits out of that and North earns dollars, it earns dollars for the entire country. So we have to think in that way and uh, engage people in conservation. That is the most important message I wanted to uh, bring here. Please engage all the people in the conservation. And we have ecotourism projects, so-called ecotourism projects, none of them ecotourism projects. Even in Pasikuda, you can see so many hotels have come along Pasikuda, which was not there before. And uh, all are being owned, not by the people in that area. And even people are working in the hotels are not from the area. So you have been now they say that they cannot go to that area that they, these people, the fishermen are unable to go into those because the hotels are very powerful people. They have compartmentalized the beach. They, they are not allowing to the local people to move around. So unless you have engaged the people, we talk about ecotourism. Ecotourism is a completely different tourism from what we what we practice at the moment. What we practice at the moment is not ecotourism at all. Just because we have a kajan hut on a rooftop and having food in a chatty pot, that doesn't mean ecotourism. Ecotourism is completely different. Ecotourism, unless you involve the people in the tourism, it's not ecotourism at all. Unless you preserve the culture of the people, it's not ecotourism at all. Unless you preserve the nature, it's not ecotourism at all. So there are three major subjects, uh, areas that if you have to do ecotourism, that has to be considered. So unless you involve the people in the remittance, in the economy, and unless you make the people to enjoy the income of the, the natural system there, other than leaving only the suffering to the public, Ecotourism is not going to work. Ecotourism, you cannot do with large numbers. You have to reduce the numbers. Crowd control is one of the major uh, uh, component in ecotourism. Yes, you cannot just think of, we need dollars at the moment. And if I tell this, I will be definitely been 
we need dollars at the moment what are you talking no then you cannot then that means you are going to destroy the ecosystem and you can see what is the situation if you go in the night in argambe ikkadu nigambu these are all the results of mass tourism where is our nature is gone so we have to think wisely and we have to think as a whole as a country and uh, thank you very much for listening to me i am ready to answer any questions thank you very much thank you dr jaman uh controversial uh, i think uh, thought provoking and uh, i think a lot of uh, new thoughts new angles to think uh, we'll uh, we'll have we have about 10 minutes uh, yeah slightly less than 10 minutes to uh, cater some questions uh, dr jaman yeah stay here we'll uh, the audience uh, can ask questions yes identify yourself and ask a question make it uh, short because then we can cater more questions thank you for your very provocative talk my name is shehara uh, just want to know because i feel depressed at the end of your talk so i'm just wanting to know whether there are any solutions or so, you gave us some but could you just tell me if by chance you were all powerful and you were minister or head of the wildlife i don't know chief wildlife uh, with, with authority and power what are the three most important things you might do yeah if i get the authority yeah assume yeah. you all power yes first thing i will ask and you have resources <laughs> okay first thing i will ask no involvement from the politicians that's the first thing i will ask nothing can be done whatever happens no involvement with the politicians and it is important to before you we impose science we have to get the perception of the people that we are going to do that and if they are against then we have to then uh, impart the knowledge and the science into them and we have to tell what is the the results of it and how it's going to benefit you so without benefiting the people in the region with the nature that they are having because they don't because we sri lankans i don't know of course you might be knowing but 90% of the sri lankans cannot swim because we have sea around us we think how oh, we can do it tomorrow 90% of us cannot climb uh, uh, mountains because we are with that so this is the same with the people in the north we are living with the wilderness they don't admire it but it's not that they don't uh, 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 really uh, they don't uh, value it but they value it but they don't they admire it differently not from from your point of view so that's the only thing so it is very important that we have to work with the people we have to convince the people what is the results that we are going to give and then through that we have to get the support and we, it's a long process it's not so i am not going to say like uh, everybody says that okay I, if you give me the uh, authority i will do it in 3 day 3 years no uh, it might be 30 year uh, program which i will pass my knowledge to the next person who can do that way that's that's the way we have to do it not immediate so we need immediate solutions that's the major problem with us we always need we need, it has to happen tomorrow uh, it has to happen in 2 years time 5 years time even the former president when he came he said uh, we will resolve the human elephant conflict in 3 years uh, you cannot there's no way that you can do it so that is the problem so they have to realize that it cannot be done this is a long process it's a long term process yeah uh Thank you, Dr. Vijayman, for the good presentation. Uh, my question is that, uh, what are um, considering the fact there are endangered species, basically, if you take that as a main thing, um, what should be the uh, entry point into this whole thing? If you appear to do something, and who will, who are, who are the possible stakeholders? Will there be any attempts actually to enhance the knowledge of the our um, our law not law makers but um, the people who are supposed to prevent all those thing because of that prevent poaching and all those thing so uh, that kind of an efforts uh, are there are there basically to enhance the knowledge and all those thing what will be the entry point and the stakeholders that we should have it yeah uh, when it come to endangered uh, uh, it's all depend on who define endanger and it's 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 mostly it's comes under scientific studies and we have to know 
what is the population trend before we talk about endangered but we have made a lot of uh, animals endangered uh, without looking at the population trend and what are the uh, the one that actually uh, made this uh, uh, species endangered uh, have we eliminated that endangered uh, that uh, particular factor that brought this species into endangered but there are now we have two monkey species uh, the macaques and the uh, the leaf monkeys are both uh, endemic uh, considered endangered but they have become pest at the moment because uh, we don't uh, it's complete protection can make uh, a wrong decision in making endangered. this because it's endangered we put a lot of efforts uh, into endangered animal and try to propagate the the population uh, more and more because that has to be done but it has to be done in a very uh, 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 i mean you have to take a lot of care a uh, lot of decisions to not overpopulate when with our uh, activities so that is the most important thing right uh, this is like because i just want to give one small, simple example if you keep a bottle of milk uh, sorry a glass of milk and leave it open the bacteria will colonize and then it will use all the resources in the glass and they all will die again because the resources are run off run out of it so this is the problem we should not leave to that level uh, there are many species that we are not considering uh, we'll still wanted to keep them in endangered list uh, even uh, very recently there was a uh, one of the famous politician told why did you remove the leopard from endangered to uh, the lower level right uh, that means that's a good effort if you are remove if you are categorizing from endangered animal to a not endangered it's an effort but he the, the, the politician thinks that's wrong it should be always kept under endangered so are you we are going to make it endangered to critically endangered is that conservation effort no so we have to try to make it out of the list so that is the the success of the uh, program but we don't want to do that we think that is bad for the animal so uh, there are certain misconceptions of this uh, endangered and why we have put it into endangered list now for the macaques we have completed uh, considered as endangered because i was also one of the members when we considered them as endangered in the the, the workshop in coimbatore in 2003 the the major criteria that we went through is 50% uh, of the forest has been destroyed for last 100 years and this could happen another 50 years so their habitats are being destroyed so that they are endangered but are we actually uh, destroyed their habitat are we enhanced their habitat the population is increasing in uh, out of the forest it's a wonderful habitat for them we have enhanced the habitat we have given a wonderful uh, highly nutritious food for them when you have highly nutritious food complete protection they will increase in population in the forest you don't have such high nutrition food for them to increase in their size so are we actually destroy their habitat or are we uh, encourage or enhance their habitat this is a, these are the question when it comes to endangered animals same with the elephants same with the elephants i don't know how do how much you all agree the elephant numbers are increasing they're increasing right the public says it's increasing i also feel that it's increasing because after mahavali accelerated mahavali program we actually gave a better uh, environment better habitat for them with food throughout the year water throughout the year and this is same thing happening going to happen for horses in nadantiv so that's why when it's endangered it's not always uh, we have to take adverse uh, actions to make it uh, increase the number all of a sudden so that's very important otherwise we will end up in nothing at the moment at the end i think in the interest of time doctor thank you so much uh, thank you Sriyan, very much uh, any other questions or we can wrap up okay one last question yeah Uh, the 
the Colombo Jaffna Road along Mana has a 30 kilometer going through Vilpatu National Park. But we improve the roads. No, it could have been done, but a group of people are protesting against that. So we have to overcome that, and there's a court case. We have to wait for the court case to over till that we cannot, cannot do anything. But we have to wait for the verdict of the court case. If the verdict of the court case is no, then we have to go for further thing. And on the eastern side also, there is a road that there's a bridge has to be built uh, between uh, Kent Farm and uh, I think on, on one section, we have to build a bridge and rest of the roads are perfect. It's already uh, tarred very well, only this has to be done. Once this has been done, then you can reduce uh, the traffic along the A9. But how can we do it? It's, it, it, it's not a, a difficult task, but it's all our decision. It's all our decision. That's all. Right? If there is a protest against that, we can work for that. But nobody is working for it. Maybe they might not know, they, because they always think on the negative side of it. But there's a positive side is also, but positive side is never been discussed at all. Now, for example, uh, this, uh, the Crudia Selenica, the one that tree that is caused a lot of problems for the highway, right? But uh, now we know that there are plenty of uh, other trees all around the, the country, right? Now, they wanted to protect only one tree. Is that because of one tree, the species is going to extinct? Now, we have plenty of, and uh, two uh, PhDs and three PhDs have already mentioned that the resources of what, what we have all around the country, and it can be found. So are we going to, uh, the, the money that was spent on this highway and the detour that we are going to do, how many millions we are going to spend on it and compare that with this. And when this was uh, discussed and somebody told that there are plenty of this, then the question came, what about that particular gene of tree? <laughs> As if that is the gene that is going to save the species. Right, but others are keeping quiet. Those who are against, those who are fighting for the negative side are very active. Those who are positive side are keep, but maybe they don't have that guts to do that. Thank you, doctor. As we always say, I think uh, the views and opinions expressed by doctor is, is personal. Uh, yes, because uh, WMPS is in quotes regarding the, uh, the road and we will, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I invite Sriyan to give a token of appreciation? Doctor, could we have you over here, please? Thanks. <laughs>